Jeff, we're finally here. Episode 50. Oh my god. I, I am amazed we have made it this far. We are here at, at 50 episodes. Yeah. All of these movies. and All these movies. Yet we still have not done an episode focused on the biggest trauma property of them all. The, Unquestionably. The Toxic <laughs> Avenger. Which is what we are here to talk about today. The 1984 cult classic the toxic avenger we are only be discussing the original movie we are not going to be discussing any of the sequels any of the cartoons any of the video games any of the toys any of the novelizations any of the comic books all those things will be coming <laughs> later down the road today just the original classic 1984 midnight masterpiece it is a classic, and it's also as old as we are, so that yes! means we are classics. <laughs> uh, I don't think that's the case. I, th I, think, I think the Toxic <laughs> Avenger is more beloved than either one of us. So does this mean that we're not getting... I'm not going to get a gritty reboot in 2023? I mean, you might. I mean, I, like, I, I Lucas don't... Mangum, the gritty reboot, you know, where I'm, like, in that gray wash and, like... I talk like this because I don't know if I'm good or bad. Dude, I don't know where your life is going, so this all this could happen. The future is unwritten, to quote Joe Strummer. See, I, I think you're a, I think if they did a reboot of, or a remake of, of you, it would be like, kind of like a nostalgia thing. Like, they would, they would probably put you back in dreads, they'd have you smoking cigarettes again, <laughs> but it wouldn't. It would just be, a, it would be purely aesthetic nostalgia. It wouldn't have the essence of Jeff, like you wouldn't you wouldn't still love a Serbian film. They would, they would like, make your favorite movie Saw or something like oh, that. Oh, oh, no, no. I mean, I, I love Saw, don't get me wrong. I love the Saw movies, but, like, no, they can't do that to me. What, what kind of reboot do you think the Toxic Avenger will get? <laughs> well, we, we are going to get the Toxic Avenger reboot. Let's, let's save that for the end of the episode yeah, to talk yeah, a little yeah. bit about what we think they're going to, or any ideas we have that we're they may be doing with this because I am very fascinated by what they've announced of the casting and who's involved with it. But this original 1984 movie, Lucas, what's your history with the toxic Avenger? Oh man. Um, it's pretty extensive. I feel like I, this movie has been here for um, so much of my genre fandom. Like I think I saw it for the first time in sophomore junior year of high school like i had seen evil dead 2 and dead alive and um like you know all the kind of like splatstick kind of movies you know that are like splattery and gory but also like really funny and and um yeah somebody recommended that i check out the toxic avenger because it was like kind of along those lines at least like you know, in, in terms of tone. And yeah, I think I bought it blind. Like, I think I just, because oh. I was in the habit of just buying DVDs at the time. And so I just, I just bought the DVD and um, I loved it. I loved, I loved how gory it was. I loved how like just fast paced it was and how funny it was. And then for like years, like I would just show it to like whoever was around who hadn't seen it. Um, like, I showed it to my brother and a bunch of friends. Like, uh, me and this one group, uh, we would, like, every time we would get high, if there was a new person in the group with us that night, <laughs> like, we would show them a to the Toxic Avenger. Like, this was, like, a huge movie for me. Like, I've I've seen it so many times. And um, I before watching it for this episode, I also watched it in the theaters uh in 2019 oh uh, shit i've never gotten to see this in the yeah. uh, theater oh uh, that's awesome lloyd and lloyd and pat kaufman were both in attendance um and uh yeah it was a great time i mean it was great seeing it on the big screen and lloyd lloyd had lots of fun stuff to say as always i think i think the you know not to go back to the remakes yet but uh i think the uh the remake had been under option by, by like arnold schwarzenegger like at the, oh, at the time it switched or... hands a lot over the years yeah. i do know that yeah, so needless to say, it's been uh, it's been in my life for a while. Um, how, how about you? When uh, what's your history with the with the Toxic Avenger? So, um, 
I've mentioned uh, previously that the first Shoma movie I ever saw was uh, Terror Farmer. And I watched this when I was in high school and working at a video store. And I was fortunate enough that working in a video store that actually had a cult movie section. And so, and they had an extensive selection of Choma films, but I had randomly gotten the Terra Firmer. It was just like, what the fuck is this? And I loved it. And I also remember around the same time, there was this website, and we've spoken of this website. Um, I don't know if we've talked about it on the show, but we've definitely talked about it to each other, Lucas. It was like, I want to say it was called like Crazy Maisie House of Horrors, or am I mixing together two websites there? I, I know there was houseofhorrors.com. Um, I don't... Okay, How- House of Horrors is what I'm thinking of. Crazy Maisie yeah. was something else that came later. Okay, yes, that's clarifying in my head. So, House of Horrors was, um, this... One of the early horror movie websites on the internet, period. And it yeah. actually had, like, these, like, categories of, like cannibal film category and cult movie category and at this time this was all kind of like brand new information for me that like you know i was a teenager Mm -hmm. and like like people right now that like if you're a teenager listening to the show and you're like i want to get into cannibal movies oh my god you like there's just so many resources available to you at the time i was like i didn't know cannibal movies was a thing i could be into like i didn't know there was enough of them (laughs) oh this is exciting Um, but they had, it was either in the cult movie section or in some like gore section or something like that. Toxic Avenger was listed as one of the movies. And I think maybe there was like a weirdo section or something. And after I saw Terra Firma, I'm like, I really like this. I want to see more of their other movies. I know that they were associated with the Toxic Avenger. And this was already on my radar because this website had said about how gory and extreme it was. So I'm like, alright, let's check out that one next. And I, like, fell in love with it immediately upon first time viewing mm-hmm. it. I was like, holy shit, what is this? This goes far. This is crazy. And it has been, uh, like you said, like, like part of my life ever since. Like, it, it was also one of those things of, when you see, like, your second Lloyd Kaufman trauma movie and you begin connecting the dots with Tromaville and all these things mm-hmm. are related mm-hmm. it just sends you down that spiral that keeps you hooked on trauma. You know, I'll just tell it right now so a couple days ago I rewatched this movie f- for preparation for our show and I watched it with Lloyd Ka- Kaufman's commentary on which I have some neat little things from that we'll get to later and um, afterwards in the evening uh, my partner had gone to bed and I was playing a strategy game on my computer and wanted to throw on a movie in the background. And I'm a big fan of crime movies. And I saw Amazon Prime had added the movie Arkansas. And it's a a crime movie um, about the uh, drug trade in the South, a.k.a. the Dixie Mafia. If you're into, like, crime movies, I highly recommend this as a good crime movie. Uh, One of the main characters is getting a promotion in the movie in the crime syndicate, and so he's going to meet the higher-up distributor for the first time. And they do that, and they go through all the deal, and they're like, all right, we're going to... um," And the guy thinks, all right, we're going to go now. And they're like, no, no, no. We're going to sit down and watch a movie. And they start playing the movie, and the guy goes, what are we watching? And he goes, Toxic Avenger. (laughs) Toxic Avenger! And so apparently in the movie, it's a thing of whenever somebody new is introduced, they're showed the Toxic Avenger. This is a thing that happens in the movie, just like you said. So I do have another funny personal story about the Toxic Avenger that I just have to share. Um, So I, uh, uh, about two years ago, um, I had a co-worker buy one of my books, uh, Gods of the Dark Web. She, and she bought it for me and and i was just like i'm so fired like my <laughs> co-workers bought the dead baby book and now i'm not gonna have a job uh and then but then like later that week like somebody um posted in our uh like at my job since it's all remote we have like this like slack is what it's called it's mm-hmm. like a message board kind of thing uh they're like so what's everyone's favorite superhero and she posted the Toxic Avenger, and I was just like, "Okay, it's fine. You're fine. You're gonna be She'll, okay. It's it's fine." <laughs> so, 
so, uh, like, and rewatching it this week, like, let's just dive into this movie. Uh, for oh, one, yeah. on this rewatch, so if anyone's, ex- we're, we're going to be going over some of, like, the histories and some behind-the-scenes stuff, but really, it, this movie's been extensively documented. Like, if yeah. you want to know all the behind stuff of it, fuck, Lloyd Kaufman wrote a book called All I Need to Know About Filmmaking I Learned from the Toxic Avenger. Like, Kaufman's recorded commentaries on this. There's, there, if you want to know all of the little details about the behind-the-scenes stuff, which is normally what we cover on this show, there's just already so much of it out there. So we yeah. want to focus on now, some of like the bigger picture stuff about this movie. Do you, before we do that, do you want to uh, give the uh, plot description oh, from Troma's website? Thank you, thank you. I almost went right past that. So yes, here yeah, I, no I have it pulled up right here. The description from Troma.com. Welcome to Tromaville, New Jersey. A small American town terrorized by criminals. The town's corrupt mayor sits idly by while muggers, robbers, and teenage punks victimize helpless citizens. Among the residents of Tromaville is Melvin, a nerdy, emaciated janitor at the local health club. That is, until he becomes the Toxic Avenger. A gang of thugs devise a cruel hoax that goes terribly wrong as Melvin is cast through a third-story window into a vat of hazardous toxic waste. However, an, un- an unexpected metamorphosis takes place. As the chemicals take ho- hold of his body, Melvin turns into the Toxic Avenger, doer of good and brutal mauler of evil. The rest, as they say, is history. The excitement is nonstop as the hero sets out to single-handedly wipe out the forces of evil that torment the people of Tromaville. The Toxic Avenger is nonstop entertainment entertainment that will leave the viewers glowing from the fun. See the film that spawned the comic book, website, cartoon, action figures, and three sequels to date. Experience the action that made Troma Entertainment a cinematic legend. See a classic three decades later. See the Toxic Avenger. You can tell that that hasn't been uh, updated in a while because it's like the film that spawned a website. Like it's like, I yeah, I know that's that one. That was the one that me me internally go, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Troma, if anyone's Troma from listening, you need to update your film descriptions. This keeps coming up. <laughs> It's okay. I need to update my website. I need to update on my website as well. None of us have done this yet. God damn it! We re- remind each other every like week. <sighs> yeah, one of these, pretty much. One pretty of these much. weeks we will. But that's a description from Chuma.com. A bit long-winded. Um, I, I don't think it needs to be that long, but it's good. I especially like the line of, "Oh, it actually is still a classic." Three decades later, I, I misread that. I like see a classic three decades later. I think she yeah. should be the line. <laughs> Because so, uh, we're coming up on we're coming up on on four 40. decades. Yeah, you know, just another reminder of that of us being old. Yes, um, yes. <laughs> but uh, I'm curious about this, and I don't. I want to preface this by saying that like this this has no bearing on whether or not I enjoy a film. Like, I mean, if you don't believe me, like listen to the blood sucking freaks <laughs> episode. But uh, how well do you think this film is? age oh like in terms of people's sensibilities i well i think that this movie is actually way more offensive than the year it came out um like i do not think this film has aged very well as with people's sensibilities like i definitely think this would be a really um uh difficult film to show somebody say under 30 as their first trauma film um, even though this is like the most famous one, what's, what's the line? I ain't never cornhole a blind bitch before. And yeah. that's a joke. You already have to be like in on the trauma sensibility. You need to know what you're getting into. Yes. Yes. It's, it's like, I think like poultry guys is an excellent introduction film to trauma. Uh, class of Newcomb high is like, that'd be like yeah, one of the easiest say, ones. I would say Newcomb high is probably... I would, I would, I would, that would be more entry level. But I, I think it's offense. I think the offensiveness of poultry guys, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's offensiveness 
Oh, actually, no. I take. I'm gonna take it back. I was about to say. I think its offensiveness holds up, but I'm like, no. I'm dating myself because I understand yeah. the context of why they were doing the specific racial jokes that they did. And right. if you weren't around for the war and terror hysteria, you're gonna miss some of the context of what. And it might come across as just straight up racist. When in reality, yeah. they were mocking racists. They're yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, um, yeah, I get. But th- this one in particular, I was a bit. I mean, Lee, it feels like it maybe it's been over a decade since I've revisited the Toxic Avenger. I'm not sure the last time I watched this movie, it was a lot meaner than I remembered it being. And I was like, also like, oh, I actually kind of like this better than some of the other trauma <laughs> movies now because of how mean this is. Like, this is. Yeah. I'm actually kind of enjoying this more than I. Because I've always loved Toxie, but it was never, like, one of my very favorites. And I actually think, like, revisiting it now with how creators are getting much more <sighs> sensitive and careful, this type yeah. of, like, really gleeful nihilism, fuck the world aesthetic, it's like, oh, this is fun. It was. Uh, perfectly embodied in that line from the from the one cop like where he says to the kid he's like ah you just don't understand you can't just go around doing things because they're right (laughs) (laughs) Uh, just poetry (laughs) and and like the point out one thing in particular that like really surprised me going back on to it i had kind of forgotten how grisly and graphic that head crushing scene with that kid is it's fucking nasty. Yeah, and that is a cantaloupe filled with cranberry sauce with a wig on it. But yeah. boy, does that look fucking great on camera. And and one of the things I think is like really cool about how they present it is they take uh, photographs with a Polaroid, and we actually mm-hmm. get our longest look at the gore via the Polaroids. So you have That's that right. little... Um, you have that little reduction in the quality of the image in the Polaroids, which makes the cranberry sauce cantaloupe look so grisly. Well, well, you know, because as we covered in the uh, Flesh for Frankenstein episode, like some gore, uh, some gore effects are just not meant to be seen. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> no, I, I own the Blu-ray of the Toxic Avenger, and I don't care what they fucking say, that Blu-ray is not in 4K. Um, it, it, it looks... Identical to the DVD I used to own. And probably... You might be right, dude. You might be right. Like, I think they're just porting over their DVDs on Blu-ray and labeling them Blu-ray. I I don't think they're different. But on on the positive side, like, this movie is not a movie that needs to be seen in ultra high definition. I think that would, like, take away a little bit from it. Well, because it's so very, um... While there are elements of it that I think still just ring very true today, um, I, I do think it is also very much a, um, uh, it's such a product of the 80s. Yes. Like, I mean, you've got like, uh, they're mocking gym culture, they're mocking cocaine, they're like, you know, there's toxic waste, there's, just, you know, it's just a very... Well, we even, as, as a Family Guy loves making fun of, we even have the 1980s interracial street gang. Yes, we do. The, the, yes, the we street do. gang is a rainbow of humanity. That yeah. was very yeah, much that's... an '80s thing. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, uh, it's it's a diverse cast. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it actually is like a very diverse cast. Actually, yes. Um, yeah, and then that's not a joke. Like, like it is actually a very diverse cast, which is something that we have brought up before on representation in Lloyd Kaufman's movies, something that he definitely thought much more about as he got older in his uh, filmmaking career. But Kaufman definitely has a diverse cast on display here. Yeah, like even here. Yeah. And in uh in his commentary he actually talks about it that this is one of the movies that he actually purposely set out to have a diverse cast of uh people and characters and I mean, the the protagonist's love interest is a blind woman yes yes that, i mean it makes sense in the context of the story because he's because he's, he's so because he's so ugly and so the blind woman can't see him and so she love falls in love with the real 
him. Yeah. Um, and she is a great character that reappears in all of the Toxic Avenger movies. The Toxic Avenger is a very happy, happily married monogamous man. He is. He is, a, and a good, good, and a good, a good husband. Yes. You know, very, very, uh, very attentive. Um, you know, uh, he he even he even cleans up the uh, junkyard that he uh, lets lets her uh, live with him in. Yes. Um. <laughs> and so we were talking about eighties, uh, and I gotta be honest, I never. Uh, I'm actually sure I put this together before, but I was like, oh, I get it this time because I've listened to the commentary before, and this time with the commentary, so uh, the Toxic Avenger has a mop, right? And yeah. so the two villains of the Toxic Avenger, like the two main things that Lloyd Kaufman is like criticizing is crime and environmental issues. And so mm. a mop, you can clean up messes, ha ha ha, and clean up crime. There may even be a, a, a third a third use of a mop because um, when, uh, when uh, Julie invites Melvin uh, to the pool to do some 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 sexy time with her he she she tells him to bring his mop as well that is true oh no i i took that that she's gonna need he's gonna need the mop to clean up the mess oh. that's how i took that joke oh okay all right i i probably shouldn't say where i was going out of that. <laughs> you think thinking. he was gonna she was asking to get fucked with the with an end of the mop maybe <laughs> Maybe. No, I I thought I took it more of like, oh, we're gonna leave a mess, and you're gonna need the mop. Okay. All right. No, that makes sense. All right. So so just two uses, I guess. Unless you know. <laughs> Listeners, for um, you to decide how the mop was gonna get used, there. You've heard Lucas and I's takes on it. It's up to you to decide now. Oh man. Um. But you know, a funny thing about that uh that that scene um, it it reminds me so much. Well, actually, no. I, this is weird now because like I saw this movie first, but then I saw the first turn on, and then I saw this movie again. But the uh, the how they prank him um, and like have him like go in the dark and like you know turns out he's making out with a sheep or whatever. Yeah. Um, it reminded me of there's a hazing scene in the first turn on as well uh, that that has a very there's no no uh, sheep shenanigans, but uh, but there's like a um, it, it, it's a, it's a similar joke, and um, yeah. there's also another joke reused from the first. I believe it's in first turn on. Uh, oh, which the snake down the inst- the dance instructor's oh, yeah. back, and it's a frog yeah. in the first turn on, and That's right. Lloyd Kaufman points out that it's the same joke, but they're moving up in the food chain. Which, for some reason, I just thought that was just an amusing joke in the commentary. Is we may be reusing the same bit while we're moving up in the food chain. And I'm like, he's got a point. All right, yeah, he's yeah, got a point. you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to go back to the mop thing real quick and about that, yeah. like, the, like the cleaning up. Um, that I think this is like one thing that is actually really astute about the movie, and this is like very serious praise about the movie, is its uh, combination of uh, highlighting the hypocrisy of the 80s, um, like, health club, health food, workout craze, and how hypocritical people were acting with the environment. And yeah. how that it was this gigantic thing in pop culture to make your body healthy, but we were at a time that lots of environmental under Ronald Reagan and lots of environmental re- regulations were getting rolled back and that we were actively poisoning our water supply and air but hey i have this trendy new health food so like i'm going to be healthy aren't i even while you're poisoning your own air that you breathe and there's like a gigantic hypocrisy and i think that hypocrisy is like the overall (sighs) core thesis of the toxic avenger Interesting. And then the mayor, who is the big bad, yes. is obese, though. Yes. But he's kind of pulling the this, this strings of, like, kind of some of the, the, the underlings who, who, are, who attend the health club. That's interesting. I think that's the overall kind of, like, thesis statement of we are being... And so then, like, the mayor, who is, like, the big bad at the end, is both unhealthy with his body and the environment. He's just... He's just unhealthy. 
And I, I think maybe, I mean, not to like put too much of like a film critic hat on, like, uh, I, I kind of feel like they're saying that maybe there's a connection, you know, like, you know, between like, you know, taking care of yourself and, and the world's like really should go hand in hand. I believe that that is exactly what the overall thesis and message of the movie is, is that we need to treat yeah. the environment like we want to treat our own bodies and we need to both be, and we need to be healthier about both that we're putting crap into our bodies from like fast food and hucksters that want to scam us over health crazes and we're putting crap into the water and crap into the air Mm -hmm. and we're poisoning our world as we poison ourselves and that's and then also even take that kind of like further of like poisoning our own minds of the cruelty we commit to each other which is why Mm -hmm. whenever Toxy is around crime it has a reaction with the the oh, what's the explanation they give in the movie? Like, there's a reaction with the chem, um, the radiation in him the that he can't help yeah. but destroy crime, he evil. destroy yeah. evil. That he reacts to evil itself. Yeah, and yeah, which is cool. Which is which why he's so yeah. violent. I like that a lot. And um, but yeah, I think there is. I think the overall thesis statement of this movie is like. We are poisoning ourselves in every conceivable way, and the Toxic Avenger is the answer to the poisoning that we are doing to ourselves. Yeah, I like that. He's going to clean us up with his mop. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that, that's really what I took away, especially on re- rewatching this. And, and also, like, all the people in the health club are hypocrites that, like, when they're like doing that sit up routine and passing <laughs> yeah. the cigarettes back and forth. Whoa, I you never see that. that up. You never see yeah. that in a movie these days. Oh no. No, no, no. Yeah. Um Oh man. Yeah, and they're like I mean shit, they're like dealing heroin and cocaine in the health club. I I remember cocaine. Is it are they are they also dealing? He heroin? gives the the one the the drug dealer, the random drug dealer who gets killed gives the one chick uh, a syringe. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. You're correct. Yeah, yeah so they're doing heroin and cocaine. Like yeah. they're not even just st- sticking the fucking weed like Yeah. They're into the bad shit. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yeah, so that's totally cool, and it's, I mean, the whole movie has, like, a lot of really interesting, like, um, commentaries on, on hypocrisy, right? Like, because even when the, when they, after they're, when they're doing the hit and run, and they, after they kill that kid, Mm -hmm. um, by running his head over in a very graphic fashion. Oh, wonderful moment, um, wonderful moment. Yeah, yeah, um, man. How many points for a kid on a bike? Um, which I which and, I want to uh, talk about that also in a in a moment, but let's continue down this this here. Yeah, but like uh, like they they um they they were they wanted to go out and do it again, but the guy in the back who is uh uh he he play, I think his name is Slug. Um, he yeah. uh, he says, yes. "Oh, I got to get up in the morning for church," and they're they're all they all understand. Like, yeah. like oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, which is cool. a great joke, which is a great joke, but it's also fitting into this theme of the theme. Hi- hypocrisy. And what, yeah. what Toxie is, Toxie is, ironically, his body's made up of toxic things. He's pure. Mm-hmm. He is pure at heart. He was morally pure. When he was still Melvin, like, the worst he did was Melvin was horny. That was the worst thing. And in Troma's universe, in the uh, TCU uh, horniness is not a sin. Horniness is positive. Sex is positive. Sex is a good yeah. thing. But polluting the environment, uh, dealing hard drugs, like these are sins. Wanting to get laid is not a sin. Damaging the world or damaging the human body is a sin. Oh, but just a quick uh, go back to that. Um, th- this was one of the interesting notes I got from the commentary. And I was like, I think Lee Kaufman fell for some um, moral hysteria. So that uh, car scene was inspired, and you have probably have vague memories of this. It was actually a moral panic in the 80s in which um, Lee Kaufman cites the New York Post writing an article about it. And I was like, oh, that sounds like the New York Post. Of, <laughs> of that gangs were driving around uh, hitting people and scoring points 
over it. Do you ever actually remember hearing about this in real life? People claim this is really happening. So I was no, I curious, don't, I don't remember that. and I was very certain what the answer was, and and looking into it in prep for this episode, that never happened. It was just like one of those moral panics that spread around. I remember when I was young and learning to drive, um, that there was a thing about don't flash your high beams at a car that doesn't have its high that beams on, because it's a yeah. gang initiation thing to then turn around and run you off the road and get you. That also never happened. That's not yeah. a thing that ever happened. And there's these various driving-related moral panics. I'm not sure if there's any, like, new ones. Um, but it's just related to the, these moral panics. Lily Kaufman in the commentary says this really happened in New York City. And he cites the New York Post as his source. And I'm sorry, Uncle Lloyd, but you should know better <laughs> than to trust the New York Post. You of all people should know better than the trusted New York Post. Yeah, something tells me they're not trauma fans over there. No, and yeah. I could find no verification that anything like this ever happened in real life. Uh, so let's relate something else to the hypocrisy. What do yeah. you think is the moment in this movie trauma has received the most hate mail of? Over. They've received more hate mail over a moment in this movie than any other scene in any movie they have released my instinct says the shooting of the seeing eye dog you nailed it 100 <laughs> percent people really don't like it when dogs die in movies <laughs> so let's and i'd like to point out what lloyd kaufman does it's like the dog was fine we never hurt a dog if you'll notice the scene that sh the shot that shows the dog being shot the fur color changes the dog yeah. was fine. And actually, how they did the scene, this is actually kind of cute, is they got a um, an actor dog. that you know The dog acts for a living, and one of its tricks was be the dog that gets shot or hurt in things. That the owner taught the dog a trick where the owner would pick up the dog and slide the dog across the floor on its side. And as Lloyd Coffin relates that the dog would be doing this for hours would do it for hours on end happy. They would get slid across the room, run back, and then get in the position to get slid again. So, like, the dog had the, was having the time of its life, and they didn't hook up any special effects to the dog that the scene where you see the gun burst happen, so, like, Coffin points out, the fur changes color. It's not... We didn't do anything to the dog. Like, the worst is they yeah. put some fake blood on the dog, I believe, which had just got a bath afterwards. Dog was fine. But that scene mm -hmm. got them, according to Lloyd Kaufman, more hate mail than any other scene in any trauma movie. And this movie, apparently people were all right with seeing the child get its head run over. Um, yeah. The, the um, implied rape that's happening in the very scene as I, I ain't never cornholed a blind bitch before. Like, he's yeah. anally raping yeah. the, the Toxie's now wife. All that. People can deal with that. But you shoot a dog. That whole set piece in that taco shop is just incredible. I, I feel the need to bring this up because I was wondering in my um, rewatching this, I was like, wait, was this inspired by the McDonald's massacre? Which the McDonald's massacre happened the year Toxic Avenger came out. So it was completely oh, unrelated. Shit. Do you know what I'm talking about when I say the McDonald's massacre? I do not. So, um, and for the, for, you're saying for the sake of anyone listening, it was a massacre that happened in San Diego, California in July of 1984 that a man walked into a McDonald's, had 45 people inside of it. He fatally shot 21 of those people and wounded via firearm 19 of the others. Only five people who were in the building when he walked in made it out without getting shot. Oh, it was man. one of, at the time, it was the uh, deadliest mass shooting in U.S. history, and it took seven years um, f for it to be topped. And of course, now we have just left that far behind in yeah. terms of what we have uh, done as a country for mass shootings. But um, no, it's, it's, it's actually vaguely similar to what happens in The Toxic Avenger, but the two things are completely unrelated. There's almost no way this guy could have Weird. seen The Toxic Avenger because it barely played outside of New York City in its first year. 
And I don't know the exact date that the Toxic Avenger got released. Um, it ha came out in May of 1984, so it came out before the shooting. And there's no way either one could have known, like, completely unrelated. But yeah, the guy went into a McDonald's, took everyone in McDonald's hostage, and for the course of, I believe, it, it, it's 77 minutes, he held yeah. them hostage and tormented and murdered and tortured the people inside the McDonald's. Shit. Very similar, though, to what's depicted in this movie. And it happened, like I said, there's no way this guy could have seen the movie. It's completely unrelated. The guy also just had a complete break from reality. Um, he Apparently, the reason he was doing it was it was revenge for what he went through in Vietnam. Uh, spoiler, the guy never went to Vietnam. So this guy had a total break from Holy reality. Fuck. Yeah. Man. Well, we don't know anything about breaks from reality on this show. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, no, the, that, that whole scene is crazy to me, man. Like, so I want to set the scene, like, there's these, 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 this, like, you know, this gang comes in and they just start, like, they tell everybody to drop their tacos and they want to take people hostage. And, okay, so remember, I feel like we talked about it in, like, way back in the Mother's Day episode, how, like, a lot of movies, they have this feeling where, like, anything can happen and, like, often does in this scene, um, there's a moment when the guy, like, puts the shotgun to the baby's face. Oh, yeah! That is oh, definitely I, something that you don't, like, yeah, really like, see in movies ever. You don't see it, and, like, you kind of, uh, I don't know, something about the tension in the scene, like, you actually feel like they they might actually just shoot a baby, like, in this movie. Yeah. Like, I, I don't, you know, I mean, we already saw the kid get run over, uh, you know, so maybe, you know. And Lloyd Kaufman, you, you fucking copped out that you didn't shoot the baby. <laughs> That's one thing that this movie needed that could have just pushed it right over the top is a dead baby in the movie. I know I'm in an extreme minority opinion on all of this. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Um, and I like that my co my co-host is you know, like, you know, like, you know, has a very young child right now. He's probably like, great, Jeff. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, it's it's all right. I, you know, I. Uh, you're used to me at this point. You're used to me. I am. I am. I know you're the dead baby guy. You, you wrote a fine. special dead it. baby scene just for me. In, just for in you. In Gods just of the Dark you. Web, which was I remember I read the manuscript and I was like, my favorite part was the baby scene, and you're like, I wrote it just for you. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, okay, but we, we were saying about the movies that, like, anything can happen at any time. And, like, that that whole that whole fast food scene, that's definitely something that, like, it comes across way different now than I'm sure it did when it was first released. That it's, it's a, I think, a scarier scene now than when it was released. Yeah. And it reminds me of that, um... It's an is, is Angst or Anguish, the movie that I love, and I can never keep uh, the title straight, that we did a podcast. Anguish. Anguish, thank you. I can never, I always want to call it Angst for some reason. Anguish. Angst is the uh, German serial killer movie yeah. that's like like a National Geographic documentary. Yes, that all has blue, um, like tinted all over the movie, if I remember right. That's a very blue yes. movie. It's a very blue movie. Um, Anguish is like, a, a, I was actually recalling Anguish watching that that's like, that movie is the definition of a movie that couldn't get made now. Uh, people talk about Blazing Saddles because of its use of racial slurs in it for comedic effect. And it's like, no, you could still do that today. Like, like the modern day version of um, Richard Pryor's like Dave Chappelle. And you could still do, you could make that movie beat for beat. Anguish you could right. not make because that movie happened in real life. Yeah. And yeah. you just, nobody would fund it. No one would release it. You couldn't make this movie. Um, that scene, like watching an anguish, that theater mass shooting scene, mm -hmm. the effect watching it now is very different, I'm sure, than when it was released. And watching that mass shooting in the fast food restaurant, I feel has a very different feel and connotation for modern audiences than when it was first released. 
it, it wouldn't have been unlike something you would have seen in any 80s action movie, you know? Yeah. Um, it, at least in terms of like, oh, these guys come in to do something bad and then the hero comes and stops it. Now, obviously, it being trauma, there's there's this horrifying, like, you know, gun in the baby's face and then, like, the seeing eye dog get shot and, like, there's a rape. But, like... Um, <laughs> That 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 sets it apart, you know. That probably set it apart then, but then also, like now, like it's like it it seem it doesn't seem like fantasy. No, no, it hits it's a, it hits a lot closer to home. It, that random it's different, as the kids say. Yeah, that random public vi- violence is unfortunately becoming a thing that is a part of American culture. In a way that other world cultures, for the most part, for the extreme most part, don't have to deal with. And it's something about the American psyche. And it's something that's been boiling for a long while. Like, there were mass shootings at this time, don't get me wrong. Like, I already brought up that I was only like, wait, was Lloyd Kaufman inspired by this real uh, fast food massacre? No, it's just a fucking coincidence that happened the same year. And yeah. it just immediately invoked it in my mind. And it's just something that's become way more prevalent. Like, I don't think you see in movies as much anymore that mass random violence without the con- without the filmmaker knowing in context of like, oh, this shit actually happens. And and when yeah. it's depicted now, even if it's in like a really exploitive thing, like say Fast and the Furious. I've never seen a Fast and the Furious movie. But so I don't know if there's any scene in it where there's a massive casualty event involving innocence. But even in just some like big blockbuster thing, if they're going to do that, they actually have to pay attention to the ramifications of that. Perfect example being the Marvel movies is they've actually done things in the movies to make it clear that like things are evacuated. Or if it's not an evacuated thing, like say in um, Age of Ultron, which is a whole city getting dropped and there were casualties in that, that actually becomes the whole plot point of Civil War. And Thanos doing his snap, um, multiple movies and TV shows have spent time addressing what that was uh, personally like for the people. Which, I forget which show it was, but one of the shows showed what happened inside a hospital when everyone came back. And I think it was WandaVision. That's what it was. Yeah, everyone... Oh, man, that scene was fucking awesome. I'm sorry yeah. for everyone listening. I know it's the most opposite of everything we talk about on this uh, show, but I do still love my Marvel. My, I do love my cape shit. I can't yeah. help hey, myself. Hey, no, that's, that's, that's a great segue, though. I mean, I... I, I uh, you know, this movie is a, is a very cool 82 minutes, and I kind of feel like modern superhero movies could learn a thing or two from that (laughs) Um, i don't disagree this is very much a superhero movie i mean it is beat for beat by beat a superhero movie like at least in terms of how the story is structured and like what the major plot points are like it's and like superhero movie very open he was very much inspired by um like the old school Marvel comics. Keep in mind, Lloyd Kaufman and Stan Lee were literally friends. Like they were people yeah. that would literally in their free time hang out with each other. God, imagine being a fly on that Oh wall. my God, that had to be... Can you imagine going to the fucking bar with Stan Lee and Lloyd Kaufman like in like the 1970s or 1980s? Uh, like yeah, that had I... to be amazing. But, um, so cool. But uh, Lloyd Kaufman is a huge like Marvel fan. He's a huge uh, superhero fan. And um, Toxic Avenger, one of the taglines that Troma has adopted over the years is the first superhero from New Jersey. Yes. And, yes. Which is great. Especially for people like us who are from the Northeast. Mm-hmm. And um, There's a little running a joke about super- shit talking yeah. New Jersey. There is, there and, is. There's even a and, shot called the Jersey Turnpike where you like all you do is you just wipe up all the fucking spilled <laughs> booze on the bar and squeeze it into a shot glass. For for anyone not from uh, the Northeast, New Jersey is a state that everyone in the Northeast makes fun of. And it's like at least I'm not from Jersey, and I think Jersey shit talks Delaware, if I remember correctly. 
Probably. probably. I, I think it's still because I had a lot of family in New Jersey, and I'm pretty sure it was Delaware was who they shit talked. No, it's really it funny because right. Jer- Jersey is called the Garden State, and it's actually a really beautiful state, and it's really it is. pretty. It has some it great is. beach areas. Um, like I don't know why we all should talk Jersey, but that was just the thing you did. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what the meaning behind yeah, it was. Now I'm on the West like, Coast, and Oregon and Washington, we should talk California. That's not what the thing is. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, specifically, is Tromaville actually Jersey City? Like, is that where it was shot? Oh, where it was shot? I actually do not know where it was shot. And not I actually thought never... I saw something like that in the credits, but I was, like, kind of just watching, I... half-watching. I actually have no idea. I wasn't paying any attention to that. And in uh, none of my research do I recall uh, mention. Oh, uh, principal photography. This is on Wikipedia. Principal cool. photography for the Toxic Avenger took place at various locations in New Jersey, including New- uh, including Jersey City, Boonton, Paramus, Harrison, and Rutherford. And then there were some other... Uh, filming done in Peekskill, New York, um, which I'm imagining okay. is a small town in central New York State. And the uh, like, they, they had a budget of about a half a million dollars on this. So that was actually one of the nice. larger Lloyd Kaufman budgets. Yeah, yeah. Who do you should talk in Texas? Uh, Oklahoma? The rest of the world. <laughs> oh, yes, it's Texas, yes. So it's every place <laughs> yeah. that isn't Texas. You're right, you're right. I should have known the Pretty answer much. to that, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay, but uh, but we we got down that uh tangent. Uh, we're talking about how this is also a superhero movie. That so this is a horror, comedy, sex film, superhero. Am I missing a subgenre? That's actually pretty close. It, there's a lot. There's so much nudity in this, and you can tell how heavily this was it's, influenced by the earlier trauma sex, the early comedies. sex comedies, especially I, the first turn on. Like, the fir- you know. yeah, and the first half of this movie is playing a lot with the sex comedy tropes. The first half, yeah, of this it's movie. the nerdy guy wants to get laid. I, yeah, I almost feel like. I wonder if, like, I mean, this is total speculation on my part. I'm sure, like, Lloyd Kaufman, if he hears this, he's going to be like, you're wrong. Um, <laughs> but, like, I wonder if, like, I don't know, like, the first few pages, they were, like, they had planned on just writing a sex comedy. But then they're like, well, what if instead of, like, and then, like, they're like, we've written so many of these. What if instead we just go with, uh, he falls in a vat of toxic waste and becomes a superhero. Oh shit! You have this actually. Um, no disrespect, but you have this ass backwards. Oh no shit! No shit. So uh, where I'm, I'm a little bit. Sub- I, I was wondering if we we're going to talk about this at all because I kind of uh, thought this was ubiquitous knowledge, but you don't know. So where this movie came from is that they had been releasing their sex comedies, but they hadn't been having the great success with that. Like they were like getting okay. some money back. But they weren't just getting into the upper echelon like they wanted to. And so, um, in the Trauma offices, they had subscription to the, um, the, uh, the uh, industry uh, newspaper uh, Variety. Now, for anyone listening that's not aware, Variety is a film industry newspaper that's meant to be read by people in the industry. And like yeah. for an example of that is if you read, um, if you're a viewer of films and that's your primary thing, never read a review on Variety's website. And the reason is Variety will outline every plot point in the review and every twist and every spoiler. And the reason they do that isn't to be assholes. It's meant to be a trade publication for people mm. in the industry can pick up and read. So one of the things that the reviews are is also full summaries of all the movies out. So you know what everything coming out, what what's it about and what they're doing. But they had written an article in Variety in uh, 1981. That's where uh, uh, Toxic Avenger started to ferment in the trauma offices. In 1981, they wrote a headline that said, the horror film is dead, which is so <laughs> ironic considering where the horror genre would go in the 80s, where it's yeah. like the 80s oh would be arguably 
in, at least in terms of United States film, the 80s were arguably the biggest time for the horror film in the United yeah. States. And if not the biggest, it's one of the top two or three times for horror films. Uh, yeah, I mean, they call it the boom for a reason. Yes, yes, the boom <laughs> happened. And so when Lloyd Kaufman and Michael Hurst saw that, their immediate reaction was, all right, we need to make a horror film. And so mm. they weren't having the success they wanted to see with the sex comedies, and major studios were now getting involved in sex comedies. They're, so they had to shift their perspective to, like, what can we offer that no one else is going to? Let's make a horror movie. And the original title of The Toxic Avenger, Avenger was actually Health Club Horror. That was the original title. No and shit. Yeah. That was the original title. And they couldn't they couldn't make the project click. It just wasn't getting right. And where Lloyd Kaufman um, uh, cites about it, that uh, he had the idea, just the epiphany of, oh, wait, we've been making comedies. What if we make a horror comedy? Which it's worth noting that in 19, early 1980s, Horror comedy was not the same subgenre than it is right now. The only reason that we even view yeah. horror comedy as a subgenre is essentially because of the 80s. That's when the subgenre yeah. really got yeah. um, formed. Now, someone's going to be like, well, what about Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein? You're 100% correct. But that those movies were few and far between. It was very rare to find a movie... And, and those were almost considered like special attraction yes yes like they weren't like this isn't a new genre we're just messing around with the properties that we own basically yes um, it, it wasn't uh, being viewed but, as a serious thing for other people to play in this sandbox but the 80s you had you had toxic avenger you had killer clowns from outer space yes. reanimator um, evil dead 2 evil dead 2 return of the living dead um i mean yeah it just goes on i mean those are like American Werewolf in London, which American Werewolf in London. a lot of people forget how funny that movie is. It's hilarious. It always surprises hilarious. me every time I rewatch that movie how funny it is. And and the yeah. list just goes on and on and on. And but mm -hmm. the Toxic Avenger was really like they were thinking outside of the box and ahead of the curve. And just as they correctly called that sex comedies were gonna become a gigantic thing, Troma was a hundred percent ahead of the curve. And that horror comedies are going to be a big thing. Yeah, because even, like, American Werewolf predates it, but, like, the other films I listed I'm pretty are sure definitely they're, after that. I'm pretty sure every single one of the other ones is after Toxic Avenger. Yeah. And when, I know Killer Clowns is 88. Oh! The Animators... I didn't. 86. I didn't realize American Werewolf in London was eighty one. That it was that early. But though, um, <laughs> I wonder if the headline about horror, horror films being dead was was uh, based on uh, how just uh, was based on on that on that film because that, that movie flop. Oh, no, I, I just I, I think like um, the fact that it can be so funny like maybe made like some industry insiders be like oh it can be par if horror can be parodied like then it's not a viable genre and now, anymore also i do want to say like while american werewolf in london is a very funny movie and i do think it is worth inclu including in any discussion of horror comedies it though is a horror comedy that's in a different humor aesthetic than all these other movies that we're listing that's American true. Marvel in That's London true. is very dryly funny. It's a very dry humor. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, yeah. A naked American man stole my balloon. Yes. 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 That's <laughs> it's, it's great. Yeah. But like, yeah, yeah. That's a great sequence. But, yeah. um, but so no, they were originally wanting to do a gritty, serious horror film, which keep in mind, Troma had already done Mother's Day, had already released Blood Sucking Freaks. So trying to do mm -hmm. really serious, extreme violence was already in what Troma was associating with. But right. and that's what the intentions were for Health Club Horror. And then Lloyd Kaufman had the epiphany of like, let's make a com let's make a horror comedy. Let's do like what we were doing for the sex comedies and do it with gore and violence. And it's great. Oh man, is that just a match made in fucking heaven? 
Like it really is. I wonder, you know, there is not one but two uh Jim Har movies that came out of this era and I wonder if like either of them were made by like former trauma people. Oh yeah. Um I well for, I can't remember for the life of me what the fuck they're called though. Like Oh, there was um, Killer Workout in Killer Workout 1987. Yeah. And I know there's another one. That's not the one that I was thinking of looking at it. Um, man, I, 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 I'm not sure what the other one is. Gym culture was such a fucking thing in the 80s. I, yeah, I mean... I, I was born in 84. I was six when the decade ended. I don't know what that was all about. But I do know, having seen a shit ton of 80s mo- media, that it's like, they were really in the gyms. I noticed this totally by chance um, while watching it the other day. Mm -hmm. Um, In the credits, I saw that Mark Torgel, who plays Melvin, who turns into the Toxic Avenger, is also credited as the script supervisor in this movie. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Do you know what script supervisor does? I, I know that they're essentially the... They basically are in charge of making sure that 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 they're on schedule essentially yes. like 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 they basically like they're basically the manager yeah, like, they're making on, sure on. that like everything that the script says is in the scene is physically there and that everyone actually reads all the lines that there's not like an exchange that's missed right. and that everyone has the most updated version of the script for what they're reading that day so it's a real important um intensive behind the scenes position and oh yeah uh yeah, oh, yeah that's neat that he was involved in it um Lloyd Kaufman talks about in the commentary that he was their first choice to cast as Melvin because he had already been previously working with Troma they liked the guy they knew him and they knew what he could do uh really interesting things about him being involved in this movie is actually let's let's go about the uh, script supervisor stuff first, and then there's a really interesting behind the scenes story about uh about okay. um Mark right Mark Mark yeah. in, in this so you know so he was script supervisor uh, why are you bringing um what do you want to highlight about that Well, I guess that that's just interesting to me because like I like I I know he's like kind of known he's known so much for being like in front of the camera yeah. as the toxic avenger um but yet he had this whole other role which as you said is a very like that's a very intense like important role yes um in this film um i don't know i mean i guess if there is a point to me bringing that up it's just that like i guess on um these sort of independent uh, film operations like People were wearing multiple hats, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah, de- definitely, definitely. And uh, I'm sure that this... Um, he actually has some uh, uh, credits that he wrote some material in the first turn on. And I can he was, totally see that. He was also the script supervisor for the first turn on. I'm just looking up his credits on IMDb. Uh, that, nice. And I also see that in the 2000s, up until essentially today... Uh, no, up until today, uh, he has a bunch of credits and behind-the-scenes roles on a bunch of weird reality shows. Like, huh. he's done... There's something called Funny You Should Ask. Um, I think it's a comedy talk show that he's been an editor on 130 episodes of. No Never shit. heard of it. But... Like, it's, I'm certain it was his time at Troma that he got his initial skills and learning how to do all sorts of different shit there. But no, um, there was a really interesting story on the commentary that Lloyd Kaufman told about him. So, there was no debating, and um, Mark won't debate this as well, that he has some unusual physical characteristics to his himself. And that he yeah. plays it up in the filming of the movie. So you can find images of him not filming in movies and his facial features aren't quite as extreme when he's not filming as he, he, he does things with his facial muscles. He's playing up 
some of the odd aspects about the way he physically looks. And right. during the filming of Toxic Avenger, it was specifically the scene where Melvin gets thrown into the vat of toxic waste and he's rolling around on the ground covered in the toxic waste, the actor actually had a mini breakdown on set during the film really? of that scene. That he essentially had a panic attack and started yelling at Lloyd about that they were exploiting him. In that, um, that they were really... He felt he was being taken advantage of. And so, Lloyd Kaufman actually stopped the filming and gave uh, Mark the entire rest of the day off and then had to have, like, a meeting with him afterwards over being like, like, are you okay to continue? Um, but really try taking his personal comfort into account. And this movie did push his personal comfort past the breaking point. I just find that is like an interesting thing to highlight. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you hear about this happening, right? Like you hear about like sometimes, yeah, yeah like, I don't know, like acting does shit to your brain, you know? I, and, um, I, and I found that interesting that, yes, this is an exploitation film. And then the it crossed over the, the line where the actor felt like, they were actually being exploited as a human being. And now, for the record, like, like the actor holds no ill regards to Troma or Lloyd Kaufman. Like, he finished this movie. He's been friends with Lloyd Kaufman. He's promoted this movie ever since it came out. He's yep. He, like, takes pride in being Melvin. But in the act of actually making it, some parts of it, like, it, it, it was upsetting rough. for him on a personal level. On some, and, and for some parts of filming this. But it sounds like Lloyd took care of him, like, you know, when he was... Yes. So, uh, what what else we got behind the scenes? Um, any Anything uh, anything that... Uh, of note? Uh, there's the one... Two things I want to highlight. Uh, one, Marissa Tomei has her first on-screen appearance is the Toxic Avenger. I have heard this from somewhere... Um, uh, it probably, actually, probably Troma's website. No, it actually came out publicly in her autobiography that she wrote, or it's an interview or something. She did some retrospective of her acting career, and she said that her first film appearance is a Toxic Avenger. That's how Lloyd Kaufman found out about it. Lloyd Kaufman <laughs> didn't know she was in the movie, or else they'd be plastering all that all over everywhere from the beginning. Oh, that is hilarious. She did a retrospective of her film career, and like my first appearance on screen is an extra, I'm an extra wearing a towel screaming in one of the health club scenes in the Toxic Avenger, and Lloyd Kaufman's like, Marissa Tomei was in our movie? <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So, um, I think that's like a really fun factoid that commonly gets skipped over because Troma never made that part of the promotional thing because they didn't know <laughs> that she was in the movie. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about that's kind of like a behind the scene thing is Troma's first screening of this movie. They did a f f cast, friends, and investors screening of the movie. And they rented out a movie theater in New York City to show it. And, like, like you know, Lloyd Kaufman's like, this is, like, our big change in Troma where we're not just doing the sex comedies, we're doing something different now. And they show the movie in which... uh. His, Lloyd Kaufman's father and stepmother were in attendance, and they brought a guest, which was, the guest was the equivalent of a justice on the, the equivalency of a Supreme Court justice, but for Germany. So, oh, so like, the German version of the Supreme Court, one of their justices was at the investment investor screening of the Toxic Avenger. <laughs> Lloyd Kaufman says that every time that one of the extreme scenes would happen, a group of people would stand up and walk out of the theater. And Man. and by the end of the movie, only one third of the audience was still in attendance, which for the record did include Lloyd Kaufman's father, stepmom, and the German Supreme Court justice they brought. And on walking out of the theater, Lloyd Kaufman's dad, the only thing he said to him was, did you really have to back up over the head? 
<laughs> and perfect. that was how the first screening of the Toxic Avenger ended. In front of Lloyd Kaufman's friends, family, peers, business associates, two-thirds of the crowd walked out during the movie, and the rest gave negative feedback. He, th- he thought he had ruined his... He talks about sitting in the theater afterwards, that he just stayed there by himself until, like, the poor minimum wage usher came in and told him he had to leave. And he was convinced he had just ruined his career and ruined his life. Instead, he made his career-defining moment and arguably the reason we're even having a podcast, the reason even anyone knows the name Lloyd Kaufman is because of this this movie. Ah, oh, man, that's so cool. Like, Isn't it's it? Like, yeah, like he just totally like went all in on something and then like thought he made the wrong choice, but then turned out to Everyone be... telling him in the beginning, like, oh, you fucked up. You, you, yeah. what did you just do? And now that gets um, to be legendary. He got to be like, like the first screening was a bad review and the German Supreme Court justice was there and a guest of my father's. <laughs> so great. Um, so I noticed, uh, and I think I bring it up in the in our class of Newcomb High episode, but um, uh, so S- Bozo and Slug, um, uh, played by Gary Schneider and uh, Robert Pritchard, um, respectively, they're like the, um, they're not the big bad, you know, the big bad's the mayor, but they're like kind of the, um, they're like the bullies in the health club, like the top bullies. Um, and like Bozo is like kind of the leader, the ringleader of them. And, uh, Slug is like the henchman. Uh, but, um, in, in Newcomb High, it's actually switched. Uh, the, the, the actor who plays Slug plays the, um, the lead Cretan. Oh, okay. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Bozo plays one of the henchmen, uh, which I thought was neat. Um, and, like, I didn't really do too much in terms of looking up um, a lot of the cast and crew because almost the entire cast and crew is all people who worked on other trauma projects. And go back and listen to our earlier episodes in which we yeah. go over pretty much everyone that worked on this movie in great detail in previous episodes. Uh, but yeah, and uh, so the movie got its release and really what led to it getting popularity was it had a one year long midnight uh, Saturday night midnight screening run in New York City and this would be from what I'm gathering from my research it was around like 85 or 86 is when this happened and that was where the Toxic Avenger got its real cult following and turned into something bigger is that oh I could definitely see that because like um I swear on some like releases I've like people I've seen people say it like I, I've seen it like wrong uh, incorrectly cited as as having come out in 1986 yes and I think that's the uh when it did its big the year-long theatrical residency in New York City. And that's what I think is confusing people, because I've seen that as well. I've seen this 86 release date thrown about as well. But IMDb, Troma's website, Lloyd Kaufman's book, everything that's, like, quote-unquote official says 84 is when it came out. Yeah. So as we've talked about before on other episodes of, like, Troma used to do like a roadshow type of opening that they'd release it in a couple local theaters in a target market and then expand from there. And even if they did the local screenings in New York city, it doesn't seem to be appear until let's go with 86, about two years later that they actually found a theater that was willing to screen it regularly. And I'm sure they did not book it for one year. I'm sure what happened is like, all right, we're, Midnight movies are already a thing by this point. And it's like, oh, yeah. all right, this seems like a appropriate midnight movie thing. Let's try it. Oh, we had a good reaction. Let's screen it next week. Oh, a good re- uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get for a month. Oh, wow. Uh, let's get for another month. Wow, let's get it for another month. I'm sure, and that's what happened until it was a full year. And 
that's uh, uh so like this movie toxic avenger the reason that it has this popularity is that this is another one of the successes of that midnight movie which i don't know how much we've talked about the concept of midnight movies on this show i don't think we've covered that on this show well i guess we should talk about it right now since this is integral to the toxic avenger success so i'm sure that pretty much everyone listening has heard the phrase midnight movie before but it's right. not just a colorful phrase. Where this comes from is that uh, that theaters in particular in New York City created this weird kind of culture of playing the strangest, oddest, weirdest movies at midnight and creating this whole mystique over going to see a movie at, <laughs> at midnight and it being something completely different than you would see during the day. So it's not like these movies yeah. had screenings during the day. You could only see them at midnight. Uh, fun fact, Lucas, what was the very first movie that um, that created the midnight release concept? Of- so I don't know if this is the first, but I have most commonly um, heard the term midnight movie applied to Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes, not the first, though. Not the first. Yeah. <laughs> the very first movie that literally created the Midnight Marketing Campaign, because when the movie came out, they didn't know how to sell it, and they literally came up with the concept of, we're only going to screen it at midnight and make it into a big deal that you can't see this movie during the day, and it's something completely different. Alexandro Hodorowsky's El Topo. Okay. That's the first yeah. Midnight movie. And do you know what the first film to try to imitate El Topo's success was on the Midnight Movie? Which then when the second movie did it and had a success, then Midnight Movies were a thing and other movies did it. The second one. Ooh. Any guesses? Uh, Clockwork Orange. Good guess. Surprisingly close, but no. Huh. Eraser Head by David Lynch. Oh, okay. They yeah. didn't know what to do yeah. with the movie, but they wanted to release it, and they saw the success that this El Topo film had, so they literally just stole the advertising campaign from El Topo and applied it to Eraserhead, and that made Midnight Movies into a thing. That's so and cool. so then there was this whole culture that existed for, oh, for 20 years, I want to roughly say, of this whole underground filmmaking circuit that had their movies playing at pretty much exclusively midnight in the crazier theaters. That's where Midnight Movie comes from. And the Toxic Avenger, for its release, they actually got some popularity. They did the uh, the Midnight Movie circuit. And so it was, this, super cool. it was the same people watching shit like, like El Topo, like... Eraserhead, like Rocky Horror, the, then they all went to go see Toxic Avenger because if there was a movie, if, like, you know, with the theaters that were cool that were in on this, when they played a movie you hadn't heard of at midnight, you all went to go see it because it's like, this is going to be some crazy shit. And so all those yes. people that were following these other movies all went to go see Toxic Avenger. And of course, they meet like, oh yeah, this is great. This is, this is exactly what we're here for. It's such a cool concept, man. Like, just, like... Because it... I don't know. Like, mid... the uh, You know, uh, Midnight and After Midnight has this whole, like, mystique about yeah. it. And so it's like you're having... It makes stuff experience. feel dangerous. Like... Yes, like, yes, or you're going to see so something like, you shouldn't be seeing. Yeah, and you go to see like, Toxic right. Avenger, like, heads, kids' heads are getting crushed and a dog got shot and... Um, and yep. man, God, we barely even touched upon the gore scenes on the movie. The gore scene that always got me was the, um, uh, the exercise equipment head crush that crushes half yeah. the head. That was always the gr- grizzliest so one. So here's a question that maybe you can answer. Um, I, on the DVDs, they used to advertise like now includes the full head crushing scene. Yes. Are they talking about? the kid getting his head run over or are they talking about the exercise equipment crushing the drug dealers? They're head? talking about the kid getting his head run over that okay. until, um, until unrated cuts were like the norm for home releases. There are, man, 
I, I might be getting some of the details wrong here, but I'm pretty sure that there are actually VHS copies of the Toxic Avenger that do not include the kids' head crushing scene, and that that, that okay. was like that was like the last straw for a lot of distributors. But when that, whenever you see mention of now includes the full head crushing scene, they're talking about the kids' head crushing scene. Yeah, I mean, I. But, I but figured, you are correct. There are even two. Though, there are two head crushes in the movie. You are correct. I, I figured. I figured it was the one with the kid. That, but, 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 funny enough, I, I, I do think the the um the exercise equipment one is more graphic. I think it's much more graphic as well. That's actually the gore yeah. scene that always stands out the most to me, and as like the most yeah. graphic scene in the movie. But, um, I also like when he uh, pulls out the mayor's guts and the mayor tries to put them back oh, in. Oh, that's one, dies. yeah. <laughs> like, like Kaufman says in the commentary, uh, that's the, w- when the movie was first being played, that, like those midnight, uh, midnight screenings, that was the moment that got the biggest applause and reaction, was when he tries putting his guts back in. And he's that's like, people awesome. always cheered and clapped when that happened. Because it's just a little twist. Totally it's just a little that. twisted. It's just like doing that just extra a little extra touch. Yeah, that that really seals the deal. Oh man, um, I don't know. Like, there's a lot of a lot of gore in this movie, and what's cool about it is like, I, I think the reactions to the gore by the other characters in the scenes are always very appropriate. Like, even even the pe- like there are scenes where the Toxic Avenger is saving people by like horribly like mutilating oh, yeah. these like bad guys <laughs> yes but the 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 bystanders are correctly horrified yes. even though they're being saved they're like oh god that's that's disgusting well, what, like, what are you doing to those people stop <laughs> why are you beating him with his arm like what the fuck <laughs> uh fun fact the guy that uh had his arm t- torn off is actually like a legit only has one arm Oh, no shit. It's very funny because Lee Kaufman has talked about that rather than create a special effect to show a one arm, like a person having their arm turned off, tore off, why not just hire somebody that's missing an arm and then we can work around the gore over their actual physical body, which is a great idea for a low budget um, horror filmmaker. And I also want to point out even though I just mentioned him, that was also something that Alexandro Hodorowski would do a lot, that he would That's hire right. people with um, missing limbs or um, different physical abnormalities of, rather than do special effects, why not just get real people and put them in front of a camera? And um, you can argue whether or not this is, is exploitive or not, and there's all sorts of film theory arguing both sides oh. about it, but this is what these filmmakers opted to do and they got people to do it however in the toxic avenger that effect doesn't hit well because it's 1980s and they're wearing baggy clothing so if you look at the guy his clothing has this like parachute like pants quality to it that's puffy in which Uh there is enough space with his puffy clothing that he could be somebody with an arm down the side of his shirt and so the effect doesn't work that well because he's wearing puffy clothing. And I'm like, yeah. dude, like you had a great idea there and you ruined it by your wardrobe. And because it's 1980s. And because you actually pay attention, that character is actually only using one hand throughout the entire scene. The entire scene, his uh, second arm is a fake arm. He never uses yeah. it for anything. And he actually gets into a fist fight with Toxie before Toxie tears off his arm. And if you pay he attention, only he's one, only using right. the one hand the whole time. It's because the other arm literally isn't real. Yeah. I love when he um, first gets it torn off and he does. I guess he doesn't notice or whatever. Like, he's just like, he's like, what now, motherfucker? And then he like looks and sees that his arm's gone and he's like, starts screaming. I don't know. Being really... Uh, <laughs> You, you, played well for you me. You know which moment fucked me up as a kid that like no one ever talks about? The guy that gets his hands deep fried. Ooh, yeah, that one's hard. That to just like struck me as such a horrific thing. Um, 
maybe because when I worked at a video store, that was my second job. My first job was I worked oh, yeah. in a kitchen as a dishwasher. And, you know, I saw, like, the frying vats and that, so I had some context. And the idea of your hands getting held in there, oh, yeah. that really, like, messed with my head as a kid. Yeah. And he, like, makes the shake in the guy's mouth, too. Yes! <laughs> that, that didn't bother me as much. <laughs> oh, man. And some, some, of, some of the other, like, uh, uh... I mean, this is just an absolutely wonderful movie and it was so much fucking fun revisiting it for this and I did not like I said I it, it's been way longer since I watched this movie than I think I think it's been over a decade since I've rewatched this movie however I still remembered like almost every single line in it every single scene that happened it was like oh it's yep. this scene oh it's this scene and this is one of those movies that it's just Non-stop, one after another. Oh, it's this moment. Oh, this is about to happen. It's constant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's constant excitement. And yep. really, this might be, as an artistic point, as an overall artistic point, man, it's not my favorite, but this might be Lloyd Kaufman's best movie. I could totally see that. I could totally see that. My, if, I, if I have any actual criticism about this movie like it, it's 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 only if i want to get nitpicky which i actually don't let's get, oh, but let, because let's hear let's hear but I, yeah but let's hear i think the very last quarter of the movie feels a little rushed yes it you know i agree in that it does kind of lose its way in like the last I wouldn't even say the last quarter of the movie. I'd say in like the last 10 or 15 minutes of the movie, it begins yeah. to lose focus a bit. And I think it's because that the story is trying to broaden out. And this is about that uh, thesis I talked about earlier, that we're having the problems dealt with on a very personal level. And the movie's attempting to make the statement of, um, while our like individual problems and individual harm all stem from uh, systematic tools of oppression. And yeah. it's trying to make that point that like with the street the the street corner drug dealer is actually being run by your local mayor. And there may be many right. steps in between, but that's what's going on. And that's what they're trying to show. And I think it's a little sloppy at the end of making that bigger point of like the problems you're having in your individual li life to trace up to the highest levels of government is the and point I, it's I, trying to make trying to make that all these problems are all interconnected. Yeah. And I, and I, and I think it, it just needed like maybe f like a few more minutes to kind of like, like not even not like just like just a little bit more time to kind of uh make that ending feel less rushed but again that's like such a small thing like i honestly yeah. feel like the film just i mean the film just works for me like uh like regardless of that i, I think um, it works great but that last like 10 15 minutes i am right there with you that's not what anyone remembers the movie for. Nobody remembers this movie no. for the end of the movie. In fact, almost no one ever even talks about the end of this movie. It's right. like, with the exception of the guts. Yeah, yeah, put back in. But, yeah. but like, like where it goes at the end with the mayor being running, like running everything. It just it, it gets a little muddy and lost. And I think it's also that it needed to have those elements introduced a little bit earlier in the movie. I think that's mm. like the. Um, I think that's the storytelling narrative problem is that it keeps changing who the bad guy is in the movie. Uh, yeah. Because it starts yeah, off as very that. local, straightforward bad guys as in the the gang that bullies Melvin. And then it gets expands into evil as a whole in all the forms that evil takes. And then it expands into those in control of our systems are perpetuating this evil. And right. so it keeps shifting who the actual villain is. And by the second shift, I feel it gets a bit muddied for the viewer over like, so who's the bad guy? Uh, yeah. Again, it's, 
it's a small thing. Yeah. Like I just, I mean, the film is, is so fun, but like, yeah, no, I, I totally know what you're saying. Like, I think like just a little bit of, uh, and then they yeah. introduce how all these things are crossing over earlier in the movie. And then us as right. a viewer know that all these things are interrelated and then Toxie then goes on the journey of what Louis Kaufman is essentially trying to say to the viewer of, okay, you have these problems with your things, these people in your personal life, but they're tied into these bigger things, and they're tied into these bigger things, and those things are tied into these bigger things, and those, at the top level, people are making fucking money off of all of these problems you are experiencing. Off your misery. Off your misery. People yeah. are making money off of it and want this to happen. Yeah. Your misery is yeah. their profit. I mean, there's that great scene in um, uh, in the, in this film where uh, the the mayor's having a meeting and like I forget what they're arg- what they're what they're dis- what exactly they're discussing, but it comes out that but that'll that'll move our toxic waste dumping ground right to the water supply for the whole town, and then the mayor just starts laughing like yeah. like a comic book villain, and he like kind of like slaps the other guy on the shoulder to get him to start laughing too. It's just so And, and if anybody listening, like, I, I hate to get like political here and that, but like if anyone listening thinks this is all an exaggeration, uh, you know, like we, we, we just had uh, uh, Donald Trump as president who was trying to sell the national parks for commercial reasons. And we now have uh, Joe Biden as uh, president and the best we are doing with environmental changes is um, a proposed pipeline did not get built. People say about a pipeline got taken away. No, it never existed. We just didn't build another one. And that's considered radical environmentalism. Meanwhile, we are still poisoning our water. We are poisoning our air. Everything yeah. that Lake Hoffman was ranting about in the 80s if anything before it was sexy if anything we've only gotten worse over it and yeah. for the love of god we need a fucking real world toxic avenger if you ask me lloyd kaufman for president lloyd kaufman for president god damn yes uh, oh man! So uh, he would probably have a mandatory uh, wanking hour. <laughs> Remember though, <laughs> sex is positive. Sex is a good it thing. Is. Like it is. Yeah. And uh, like, like in the in the world of trauma, being horny is not a sin, nor should it I, be. I am a hundred percent in favor of a but, of a. But, of a but poisoning our air and hour. water should get your eyes gouged out. And you know what? Yeah. I am on board for shit. This is this is crossover and encouraging federal crimes that you told me I'm not allowed to do Ooh. anymore. I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah. Okay, Spotify. That was satire. Satire. That was a joke. Satire. Humorous. Yeah. Um, Damn it. Joe Rogan ruined everything. <laughs> <laughs> I want the Toxic Avenger to meet Joe Rogan. That's something I would I would pay money to watch. And I know how that would go down. And I can't say how I think it would in fear of... Lucas tells me I'm not allowed to encourage federal crimes anymore. <laughs> so, but I'll just say I just want Toxie to meet Joe Rogan. I want Toxie to meet Alex Jones. I want Toxie to meet Mitch McConnell. Toxie to meet... Donald Trump. Toxie to meet Joe Biden. I'm nonpartisan here. I want them all to get what's yeah. coming to them. <laughs> all right. Um, I am definitely going on that road and we should stop. And um, would you like to hear the New York Times review from... I would love that. Yes. Yes. So once again, I found a New York Times review from April 4th, 1986. So I believe this is during that year long midnight midnight screening of the toxic avenger and the review is written by stephen holden i know we've read yeah, this guy i've definitely heard yeah, that name yeah definitely shout out stephen holden no idea who you are you know keep big, doing what you're doing if you're still yeah alive. yeah like we we love you you're <laughs> awesome we're amazed so once again trauma ca- coverage in new york times i love it new york times film reviews they they know what's what and so here's a review. Trumaville, New Jersey, a town whose corrupt public officials sit around stuffing themselves with junk food and collecting graft proudly builds its collecting graft? Proudly built I don't know what that means, do you? No. G R A F T. I I mean I know what skin grafts are. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I know about like grafting something. Okay, um, whatever. Collecting graft. Bradley bills itself as the toxic waste capital of the world. Even the beautiful people at the local health spa are moral monsters whose favorite sport is running down children in fast cars. In between pumping iron and making... Okay, I think what's going on... I haven't read this in advance because I normally don't read the reviews in advance because I think it's really fun to read them on recording and have us um, take them in. I think that there's an issue with this review in a automatic scanning. Um, like ah. a computer scanning, and that nobody vetted it. And making as as signations is that a word? I don't know. As as signations. Um. Oh, actually, wow, that's a word. I'm sorry, that's actually a word. An appointment to meet someone in secret, t- typically made by lovers. Ah, yeah. As signations, everybody, we've all learned a new word together. That's when you have your Yay. that's when you have your secret rendezvous with your sweetheart. You're having an a- a- as signation. Okay, okay, all right. Never mind, never mind. Real world, real word. Learn something there. As signations in the sauna, these demented health nuts also delight in tormenting poor Melvin. The Jim's mop boy, who is almost a dead ringer for Mad Magazine's Alfred E. Newman. Oh, we did not mention that at all. That has to be on purpose. I made that connection as well. That that yeah. uh, I think like there is definitely a thing in the way that um, Mark Torgel makes himself look that he's trying to invoke Alfred E. Newman. And if somebody mm-hmm. listening to this doesn't know what I'm talking about, just look up Mad Magazine. You, you'll find that that's a whole another. Uh, thing I don't need to explain right now. <laughs> yeah. One evening, after being made the butt of a particularly vicious practical joke, Melvin jumps out of a window of the spa and lands in a vat of toxic waste that is being transported to the local dump. After being immersed in what looks like boiling lettuce, Melvin is transformed <laughs> from a 98-pound nerd into a growling Frankenstein-like Hulk who immediately sets about cleaning up Tromaville of corruption and evil. The Toxic Avenger, which opens today at RKO, Warner Twin, and other theaters, may be trash, but it has a maniacally farcial sense of humor, and Tromaville's evildoers are dispatched in ingenious ways. One is dry cleaned to death, which we didn't talk about. Another is <laughs> made into a pizza, a third partially French fried. Along the way, the ho- the Hulk also falls in love. The Hulk, a little Marvel reference right there. Remember, yep. Lake yep. Hoffman and Stan Lee are, were good personal friends. Along the mm-hmm. way, the Hulk also falls in love with Sarah, a blind girl whose seeing eye dog has been shot by an assailant in a fast food parlor, and the two set up housekeeping in the local dump. In the film's funniest moment, one that ridicules all movies as sentimental sentimentalize the love between ugly and blind, Sarah gropes about the kitchen to prepare the Toxic Avenger a very special meal. Aglow with tenderness, she hands her true love an overstuffed sandwich, fizzing with Easy Off and and sprinkled with Drano. (laughs) Out of the muck! And that's the last end of it. I think the review got cut off early. It just says an out of the yeah. buck and there's no punctuation. I think I got uh, cut off early. Um, ju- I, th- I mean, I think that sounds like a, a generally positive review. Yeah, I would say and, so. And it says, like, um, they got its humor. Like, yeah. maniacally yeah. Far- uh, farcial um, sense of humor. Like, and Truman evil doers are dispatched in ingenious ways. I, I-, I think they... We're I, going think for they, a positive I think thing. they enjoyed Unfortunately, it. Unfortunately, we don't have the very end of that there. We we mentioned that it is getting remade. It's been in development hell for over a decade, and it was actually Things sold are... as part of the um, as part of the deal which made the Mother's Day remake. Which it, Mother's Day remake for anyone that hasn't seen it is surprisingly solid. We have oh, yeah. a full two hour long episode on the Mother's Day, Day remake. I highly recommend checking out the remake, and then going and listening to our episode, and I guarantee you I will probably 
t say some things that might be upsetting. And not in the way that was being <laughs> offensive, but in terms of there's some real world stuff about the movie that's very upsetting. And also, oh, yeah. I will be give you valuable tips on how to survive a hostage situation. Or whether or not you are going to survive a hostage situation. And so now we... um. The Toxic Adventure rights were actually sold at the... For, the rights for a remake were actually sold at the same time. And we are now, I believe, 2023. It's going to actually come out that uh, film principal photography has finished. Like, That's they've awesome. already shot all uh, of it. And it's crazy looking at its history that you had mentioned about Arnold Schwarzenegger being involved at one point. Well, mm -hmm. I didn't know... Fucking Gomero de Toro was attached at one point. Oh, he could he would have been perfect. I too. actually disagree. I don't think he would have done a good Toxic Avenger remake. I actually disagree with you. I mean, like in terms of like creature design and stuff. Oh, I'm sure he would with that, but um, Del Toro's sensibilities are too whimsical for trauma. I and could see I that. adore I could Del, see Del, that. Del Toro. Del Toro is one of my favorite modern creators. I just don't think he's in the same uh, wheelhouse that Troma is. They're doing very different things. Yeah. This is an interesting cast, dude. Oh, this cast is uh, looking so, crazy. We've got, you know, we... we well, hold off, I, hold I, off who the Toxic Avenger is. At least what it's I actually don't know. Okay, so we have attached to this Elijah Wood, Julia Davis, Kevin Bacon, Tyler Page, and Jacob Tremblay. And there's another big name, which everyone listening to is, why haven't you said the big, big one yet, which I'm going to get to. So this is happening, part of the reason this is happening is, do, do you know that Elijah Wood is actually like a horror super fan fanatic? Oh, he's, yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's he's down here at Fantastic Fest every year. Like, like, like he's, he's in our wheelhouse, like he likes the shit we like he is a horror super nerd well, yeah he's in that fucking that maniac remake oh yeah which was which was yeah, great i loved it oh yeah. I, like he's done involved in such weird weird filmmaking um after his lord of the rings period which i think is awesome it's super cool being like he made all the money he needs to and now he's like, I'm gonna get weird with yeah. with the rest of yeah. my career because I don't need to make a, nothing I ever do for the rest of my life is can ever needs to be motivated by making a penny again. Like he was involved with, like the Greasy Strangler. I don't feel at home yep. in this world anymore. Mandy, come to Daddy. Daniel isn't real. The Color Out of Space. Like these are all Toad great Road. movies. Great movies. Mm -hmm. It's it's his company, SpectreVision, yes, right? Yes, SpectreVision, which yeah. he himself founded because he wanted to finance with his own personal money weirdo horror shit. Weird ass shit. I, love I know. That. Like, I love that. Like, he's actually, like, one of the people, like, man, if I was rich, this is what I would do. He did it. He actually did it. Yep. Uh, and yep. I love this. Um, but now, like, the big name. So, we, we already mentioned that, uh, that he got... Um, like some of the movies he really he released his company Spectral Vision, which got um, which is how we got hooked up with McCon Blair, who did who's directing. Yes, who's writing and directing the Toxic Avenger remake. Who he did I don't feel at home in this world anymore, which is a really excellent movie. Um, it doesn't yeah. feel anything like a trauma movie, so I'm really intrigued to see how he's going to be. Um, handling this but it's an excellent movie and where he first became on my radar is he was one of the main evil nazis in green room right um correct me right. if i'm wrong isn't he the uh the nazi that gets unzipped i think so. I, I think he's and if you don't know what i'm talking about you need to see green room and if you've seen green room you know exactly he's also in that about. guy's other movie blue ruin yes yes which Blue Ruin just didn't hit for me the way Green Room did. I know people yeah, love it. They're both good. Uh, love it. Yeah. Um, I, I I actually found Blue Room, Ruin a bit of a chore, whereas Green Room is easily in my top five movies, my personal top five movies of all time. Nice. Yeah, I could totally see that. It's definitely definitely a Jeff movie. Green Room <laughs> is like the definition. I was literally invited to be in the movie, and they couldn't put this is 100 percent true. Casting director reached out to me to have me in the movie uh, because all the Nazis are pulled from the Portland art weirdo punk scene. 
but I had the dreaded mohawk at the time, and there's no way that they incor- could incorporate somebody with dreadlocks into a Nazi bar. So unfortunately, no, I couldn't be in the movie. Not. Though two friends of ours, Cameron Pierce and J. David Osborne, do have, I guess, essentially cameos in Green Room. J. Yeah. David Osborne, um, great writer, runner of uh, Broken River Books. He um, appears as one of the attendees of the uh, Nazi concert. And Cameron Pierce, you don't see him in the movie. His appearance was actually cut from the movie. But when the red laces show up, Cameron Pierce was actually one of the red laces. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Cameron Pierce was yeah. ultra Nazi. Which is it's like hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. But um, but sorry, oh, I got man. down the tangent there. But uh, green room that. But the big thing about the Toxic Avenger remake is who is currently being uh, credited as they they renamed um, Melvin to Winston for some reason. Uh, hmm. But whose credit is playing Winston slash the Toxic Avenger is fucking Peter Dinklage. Of, That's wild. of Game of Thrones fame. And everyone's like, so is Peter Dinklage playing like Melvin? Or like this thing's version of Melvin and then going to transform and it's going to be a different actor? Or are they going to do the Toxic Avenger as a little person? Which actually, I am 100% there for that. <laughs> I actually kind of hope that Peter Dinklage is actually the Toxic Avenger. And... There, that's what's going to be the spin on it, that, which would be very be much. This would be my pitch because it'd be so much in terms of trauma history, trauma aesthetic, also trauma's love of giving power and attention to people who are physically different than the yeah. norm. And let's make the badass superhero monster that kills everybody a little person. That sounds totally like trauma aesthetic, and I am. Um, if that's the case, I am a hundred percent on board. That could really work. That could really yeah. work. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm really excited to see it. I, I think um, the right people are behind it. I mean, Elijah Wood's invi- involvement already. The very gets fact me, that like, he's involved with them, like, okay, this is yeah. actually probably going to be really good because his company's yeah. been very very good at the work they've put out and the fact that having like peter dinklage like guys like that's insane so good so and for good. the record lloyd kaufman and michael hertz have given their full endorsement of it now in all fairness that doesn't mean anything right right They're, they were very open <laughs> and honest that they are craven crass capitalists and if the if the check is the right amount they will sign off and endorse anything if the price is high enough. <laughs> totally get it. <laughs> um, but that that's coming out. Um, it tentatively is scheduled to come out sometime in 2023. So I'm really excited. No one knows what the hell is going on with this movie. Just like I, what this I movie really is. hope. I really hope, honestly, that it comes out uh, the same week we have episode 100. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. That'd be awesome. And just for everyone listening... Lucas and I already have a very special plan for the episode we're going to do when the uh, Toxic Avenger remake drops. And so everybody with all their podcasts, like, yes, we will do an episode covering the Toxic Avenger remake. We we have to. We have to. Yeah. But the week when it drops, nobody in podcast world is going to see it. And everybody else is going to do their Toxic Avenger retrospectives. And everybody else is going to talk about the Toxic Avenger and its sequels. And maybe, maybe, if they're really trying to take it serious, they'll mention the Toxic Crusaders children's cartoon show. And maybe, maybe, if they're trying to do a really deep dive, they'll, they will uh, mention the Toxic Avengers video game. And if they're going to go really deep, they will mention the comic book. But all those people, not one of them, is going to fucking cover what we are going to cover. And I am not going to say what it is, not to give anyone else some ideas, but I will say if you're an attentive listener, earlier in the episode, I actually dropped what it is what we're going to be covering. So, there you go. Hell yeah. Um, 
All right, Chef. Yes. Do you do you do you got anything else, or are we gonna are we gonna tell people whether or not we recommend, <laughs> recommend this thing or not? Um. I wow. Mean, I think it's obvious. Wow. Um. Do I have anything else I want to bring up about this movie? Um. Now let's just go into the recommendation. Let's just go. Let's just go right into that. Um. I, let me start. Let me start it off. Let me start it off. Yeah. yeah. This movie's wonderful. This is this is a truly true time capsule of history, filmmaking, aesthetics, politics, morals, film techniques, just everything. And revisiting this after probably not having seen it for a decade, I walked away from this liking it better than I remembered liking it. And that's not saying I ever disliked it. I never thought it. I always said I loved this movie. And rewatch it now, I was like, wow, I like this movie more than I remember liking this movie. And overwhelmingly, enthusiastically, if for some insane reason you are listening to this show and you have not seen The Toxic Avenger, my God, you have to see this movie. You just absolutely have to see it. Fuck that, that, that. That crime drama, that, that that crime drama movie I watched, Arkansas, which is as mainstream as it fucking gets, dropped the Toxic Avenger is fucking cool. And yes, if you have not watched the Toxic Avenger, you are not cool. So make yourself cool, watch the Toxic Avenger. Fight crime, yeah. clean up the world, fuck politicians. I love this movie. Yeah, and no, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And, um... I would even like I would put a rider on that and say like even if you if you have seen it watch it again. Yeah, watch it again. It's it's because really aged man. interestingly. Like wow. Yeah. Um like like you said you hadn't seen it in about a decade and like yeah. you came away like mind blown. Yeah. Um I revisit it every few years because it's just a special movie to me. Um yeah, I think I think I, I definitely recommend it, and I think like even if you have seen it, we'll watch it again. Yeah, this, this definitely like especially if you haven't seen, if you're like me and haven't seen it in like a decade, it's really worth sitting down and watching it again because how our entire world has both changed and also stayed the same in a lot of ways makes a lot oh, of yeah. this movie hit really differently, and it's just really interesting to to see that. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, so what, what are we going to do next week? What are we, what are we on? So if I recall in our timeline, next week is our, um, our free for all episode, our episode to pick a movie not related to Trump and it's my turn, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Because I've accidentally like chosen the last like three. Have you chosen like the last three movies? I chose Eyes of Fire. I chose. You chose Toxic um, Avenger. And I chose the Something Weird discussion. Oh shit! You did do the last like, three. Wow! <laughs> I didn't even realize that. So, uh, so my last pick was Suicide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Eh. Fine. Whatever. So then, but I, I, I do believe the next movie is my pick. I already had plans for oh, this. Wait. I already had. A... So I did the last two then, because yeah, Suicide was after Eyes of Fire. Oh, okay. Anyway. Okay. Well, it's my turn for our free for all. And yeah. I, based upon a conversation we had on a previous episode, and I think this falls 100% in our wheelhouse, we're going to watch a movie you've never seen. Oh. Yes. We are going to watch, for next week, the 2014 body horror, extremely divisive movie, written and directed by Kevin Smith, we're gonna do Tusk. Oh shit! Yes, we're gonna do Tusk next week. It's it falls exactly in this show's wheelhouse of a. This is a modern exploitation film. Yeah, and I cannot believe you have not seen this. We have to do this. There's the behind the scenes of the movie is super interesting. Just there's so much interesting shit for us to talk about this movie. And Tusk is a movie I fucking adore. I love Tusk. So I'm really yeah, happy I, to share I don't this know with why you. I've never seen that I, one. I, I, I was shocked when it came up. I forget which episode it was, but we were it came up and you mentioned I hadn't seen that. I was like, alright, that's my next pick when I get the get the yeah. free for all movie. 
on picking Tusk, I have not forgotten. We are doing Tusk next week. Awesome. And now you have gotten to see it. And it's, man, dude, I can hardly wait to hear your reaction to it. I'm excited because I, I, I do like all the, uh, I like all of uh, Kevin Smith's, like, I don't give a fuck movies that I've seen. So And, like, which amazes me that you haven't seen Tusk. I know, Because I this know. is his most I don't give a fuck of all of his I don't give a fuck movies. <laughs> and I argue, it's my personal favorite movie by Kevin Smith. It's, it's my absolute cool. favorite Kevin Smith movie. Cool. And for the record, I am actually, like, a Kevin Smith fan. I really enjoy yeah, almost same. all of his movies to some degree. Uh, but but Tusk is my absolute favorite of his work. It just hits me on all the right notes. I'm so excited to share it with you. Awesome. So that's what we're doing awesome. next week. Kevin Smith's Tusk. For our 51st episode. Jesus Christ. We did it, Lucas! We, we did it. We're at the end. We did 50 episodes! <laughs> oh my <sighs> god. And we still have so much more to talk about. I know, it's great, it's wonderful. So much more to come, um, we, so much more to come. So much more trauma, trash, exploitation. Fucked up shit, like... Fucked up shit, Oh my god, yeah. and... It's gonna be it, great. Wow, we, there's so much more to come. So, uh, Lucas, what do, you, what do you got to plug this week? This isn't so much a plug as it is, uh, congratulations to, uh, friend of the show, Brian Asman at becoming a number one bestseller on Amazon uh, this past week with for his book, Man, Fuck This House. Okay, I just want to stop it. there, right there, and just make sure that everyone listening hears that title properly. He wrote a haunted house novel called Man, Fuck This House. That is the greatest title for a haunted house <laughs> anything I have ever heard. I am, like, jealous of Brian that he came up with that it's so perfect i am like jealous that i did not think of that title for something it's 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 so per it's so perfect it's a wonderful title. admittedly um, i have not read this book i've read many books by brian asman he's an extremely talented writer he is really really great i have not read this particular one yet though i i am a sucker for haunted house stories so i really need to get myself a copy of it Oh, it's a good one, and, like, it's cool to see it taken off the way it has. Um, I think um, I think a lot of it has to do with that title, because uh, it, 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 like you said, it it's, is... It's, just... it's, it's brilliant. It's a brilliant fucking title. I am it, I'm so impressed with that title. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he's got other stuff out there, too. I mean, I've, there's a, he's got a book called Nunchuck City uh, that I actually have a story in, even though it's, like, it's a novella, but then he, like, he brought, like, other author, like, he brought me on to, like, write a story, like, a bonus, as a bonus <laughs> That's feature, pretty neat. basically. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. I also, um, um, oh my god, it's so funny you bring up Brian Asman, because how he first came on my radar was I was working at um, Eraser Red Press, when they published I'm Not Even Supposed to Be Here Today. Oh, yeah. which, Speaking of Kevin Smith. <laughs> which is a Kevin Smith like tribute parody thing. And I actually blurbed that book and um Cool. Yeah, you know, like, I, I, I really I really enjoyed uh, I really enjoyed that one by him. And he also has a book that I hope it's gonna appear in some fashion somewhere. Um I'm, I you know I'm not gonna say I'm, I shouldn't say anything about it. that's private knowledge. I shouldn't say anything. Because uh, I don't know what's going on. But he has another book that I read by him that I really love. And I hope it gets an actual release somewhere. That way I can publicly talk about how great it is. Cool. cool. Which, tying into Toxic Avenger, he did like a horror superhero type of oh, nice. thing. Which I've nice. read. And to, it's it's not out anywhere yet. And I wanted it to come out because it's really fucking cool. And it actually really cool. tied in perfectly the the Toxic Avenger. But... I'm, oh, it totally would. When that book yeah. comes out, I will be plugging it on this show. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. But yes, but no, but we're talking about, man, fuck this house. Fuck this house. Yeah. So what's, uh, what, what do you got to plug? I want to plug something that I haven't read and I don't know anything about, but there's a new extreme horror book that came out that is vaguely inspired oh, yeah. by things that actual real world events that I was involved in and I am so 
impressive somebody wrote a book about this i am buying a copy of this i have not read i'm buying the cop i'm buy i need a physical copy of this book yeah. to have in my collection just because it exists that it's um the book is called gross out by duncan ralston in case i'm mispronouncing his last name it's spelled r-a-l-s-t-o-n and it's about the annual gross out contest you know, the real world gross out contest that we, both of us, like, yeah, like are very highly involved in and mm -hmm. happens at KillerCon every year. And it's about um, a author who got canceled due to their gross out contest performance before the pandemic. And then the pandemic happened and now conventions are coming back and the gross out is coming back and the author that got canceled is coming back to essentially have the revenge. I'm not really sure. I read the book yet, but anyone who's familiar with my own personal history with Deadlight Press and Eraserhead Press and the gross out contest slash Ultimate Bizarro Showdown will immediately see that the that Duncan here wrote this book vaguely based on real life events that <laughs> happened and I am so curious am I a character in this book in some fashion so I oh, need man. to buy a copy and I just need to give Duncan Ralston a round of applause for being the one yeah. that like we were talking about before recording that I was so amused by this and I was so giddy over it telling Lucas about it I just found out about this new joke about 30 minutes before we started recording and Lucas is like, well, you didn't do it, Jeff, and the other author involved didn't do it. Somebody had to do it. And yep. Duncan, <laughs> you did it, and for that, you earn my kudos. You also earn a book sale for me and also a plug right here. So, well yeah. done. Well done. Awesome. Holy shit, that's awesome. 50 episodes. That's 50 episodes. Goddamn.